If the United States and our allies are to maintain the defense required to safeguard our peace and freedoms, we must have a clear understanding of the threat posed by the military capabilities and doctrine of the Soviet Union. As reported in Soviet Military Power, 1988, neither glasnost nor the stirrings of economic reform within the Soviet Union has resulted in any redirection of resources away from the armed forces of the USSR. Soviet strategic nuclear forces, land, sea, and air, continue to be upgraded. Soviet strategic defenses, including the ballistic missile defense system around Moscow, continue to be upgraded. The across-the-board modernization of Soviet conventional forces, tanks, artillery, fighter aircraft, surface warships, and submarines, marks an unprecedented increase in Soviet military capabilities. The most recent evidence of the continuing buildup of Soviet nuclear and conventional force capabilities is documented in this video, which accompanies the Soviet Military Power 1988 publication. The first half of the 1980s saw a rapid change in the Soviet leadership. The old guard was replaced by a generation that has more experience with the West and a greater flair for public diplomacy. Despite this new look and efforts to portray a commitment to peace, Moscow continues its arms buildup with weapons systems like this Typhoon strategic ballistic missile submarine. Each missile can carry up to nine nuclear warheads all capable of reaching the U.S. from its home waters. By 1987, five typhoons were at sea, and two or three more are expected by the early 1990s. The typhoon is not an isolated example. It is representative of an across-the-board modernization of strategic and theater nuclear forces, as well as conventional ground, air, and naval forces. The result is weapon systems that are more accurate, lethal, and survivable. During 1987, the Soviets began to deploy the SS-24 Mod-1 ICBM. This rail mobile missile carries 10 nuclear warheads and is replacing missiles that carried fewer. They launched the SLX-17 Energia, a heavy lift space launch vehicle. This shows their ability to place heavy loads, such as space-based weapons, into orbit. They deployed a modified Yankee-class submarine fitted to launch the SSN-21, a long-range sea launch cruise missile. This increases the nuclear threat to Eurasia and North America. The Soviets deployed a fourth Kiev-class aircraft carrier and the third Akula-class submarine, further improving their naval strength. Their mainstay AWACS aircraft became operational, as did their new Midas tanker. The two give greater range and guidance to Soviet aircraft. Also, the AN-124 Condor heavy lift transport aircraft became operational. It is able to carry large, heavy cargo, such as tanks and missile systems. Nuclear war should never be fought and cannot be won. We shall not seek to achieve military superiority. The General Secretary's words at his press conference in Washington reaffirmed his statements made in Geneva. These words suggest a shift in Soviet military thinking. However, actions speak louder than words. Even with the limitations of an intermediate-range missile treaty, nuclear systems, like this road mobile SS-25 ICBM, can strike targets in Europe and Asia, as well as the U.S. And if a START treaty cuts the Soviet strategic nuclear arsenal in half, the Soviets would still have enough warheads to hit all important U.S. and Eurasian targets. Mobile ICBMs, like the SS-25, and the SS-24 Mod 1 present elusive targets to Western defense planners. Silo-based ICBMs, such as the SS-18 and its follow-on, have multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles 
and the accuracy and explosive power to attack multiple targets in the U.S. and destroy even reinforced missile silos. New generations of submarine-launched ballistic missiles have greater throw weight, range, and accuracy. Each Typhoon-class submarine carries 20 MIRVED SLBMs. Each missile can launch nine nuclear warheads. The new Delta IV-class submarine carries the SSN-23 missile. These missiles are equipped with up to 10 warheads and have improved range and accuracy over the SSN-18. Both the Typhoon and Delta IV will primarily operate in ice-covered areas near the Soviet Union. The lead unit of a new class of strategic ballistic missile submarine support ships joined the fleet in 1987. It will allow nuclear submarines to reload missiles in protected waters. The USSR also has put renewed emphasis on manned, long-range bombers. They have produced over 70 of the new Bear H bombers in the last five years. The Bear H carries the 3,000 kilometer range AS-15 nuclear cruise missile. An all-new bomber, the high-performance supersonic Blackjack, will also carry AS-15s or other bombs and short-range missiles to inland targets. When the recently negotiated INF Treaty is fully in place, there will be a change in the composition of Soviet theater nuclear forces. The systems earmarked for elimination are this SS-20, the SS-4, SS-23, scaleboard and ground-launched cruise missiles. The SS-20 is fully mobile and has three highly accurate MIRVED warheads that can be delivered to a range of about 5,000 kilometers. The SS-4 is an older missile with a nuclear warhead and a range of about 2,000 kilometers. In the shorter range category, the Soviets have the new and highly accurate SS-23, as well as the scale board, which has been modified recently for improved accuracy. Both the SS-23 and scale board can be positioned quickly to attack NATO targets. The newest of the Soviet theater nuclear systems ready for deployment is their long-range ground-launched cruise missile. This mobile system would probably follow operational procedures similar to the SS-20. Even when these theater nuclear systems are eliminated, the USSR still can reach Eurasian targets with backfire bombers, Badger medium-range bombers, Fencer fighter bombers, as well as the Bear and Blackjack long-range bombers. In the North Atlantic and in the Pacific, ballistic missile submarines of the Yankee class also can target their missiles on Eurasia. And on land, the Soviets have a variety of tactical weapons, like this Frog and the SS-21 to support ground forces. Also, Soviet howitzers, field guns, and mortars are capable of firing nuclear munitions. Even when ratified, the INF Treaty will not totally eliminate the nuclear threat to Eurasia. The vast nuclear arsenal possessed by the USSR and the variety of delivery systems available still present a significant threat. Practically, the Soviet Union is doing all that the United States is doing. And I guess we are uh, engaged in research, basic research, which relate to these aspects which are covered by SDI in the United States. This comment is a dramatic departure for the Soviets. It's the first admission by a Soviet leader that they are doing high technology research on strategic defense systems much like the SDI program in the U.S. The Soviet program has been underway for more than 20 years. The USSR's laser program, for example, dwarfs U.S. efforts with over 10,000 scientists and engineers and more than half a dozen major facilities devoted to laser research. Unlike the U.S., the Soviets already have ground-based lasers that can damage satellites and they could develop systems to use against ballistic missiles by the year 2000. They are also experimenting with exotic technologies like advanced kinetic energy, particle beam, and radio frequency as defenses against incoming ballistic missiles. The Soviets also have an extensive strategic defense program greater than that of the U.S. 
For example, the modernization of the ABM system that rings Moscow is nearly complete. There are now 100 missile launchers in two rings around the city. The system includes the Galosh interceptor that can destroy incoming missiles still outside the Earth's atmosphere, and the shorter range Gazelle for interception nearer the target. Battle management for the system probably will be performed by the new, large, phased array radar located north of Moscow at Pushkino. When the ABM system is fully operational, it will defend the Moscow area. There also is a network of new radars throughout the USSR that could provide target tracking capability, possibly forming the basis for a nationwide ABM system. One of the new phased array radars, located at Krasnoyarsk, is in violation of the ABM treaty. It is not located at the edge of the Soviet Union, nor is it pointed outward, giving it a target tracking capability not permitted by the treaty. The Soviet Union also continues to invest in a passive defense system that includes hardened underground facilities to house essential personnel for missile operations during nuclear war. Throughout the Soviet Union, both in and outside large urban areas, facilities exist for the leadership. Some of these are near the surface and are made of reinforced concrete. But there also is an extensive system of command posts, hundreds of meters deep underground, to protect the most important government officials. They can shelter thousands of people and are capable of independent operations for months. Moscow's metro is connected to deep underground command posts, allowing leaders to covertly escape to passive defense facilities in the suburbs. The purpose of these facilities can only be to provide leadership protection for centralized command authority during a protracted nuclear war. The peaceful exploration of outer space is the constructive alternative to the plans aimed at spreading the arms race over to outer space. Although the president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences stresses the peaceful exploration of space, the Soviet space program is predominantly military, both in its missions and objectives. On May 15, 1987, the Soviets conducted the first flight test of the SLX-17 Energia, one of this heavy lift vehicle's payloads will be the Soviet Space Shuttle Orbiter. However, the Energia is versatile enough to launch other payloads in excess of 100,000 kilograms, such as a large space station, components for manned and unmanned interplanetary missions, and possibly anti-satellite and anti-ballistic missile defense weapons. Last year, the Soviets also deployed the SL-16 launch vehicle, a more economical way to lift medium-weight payloads. One possible payload for this launcher could be the manned space plane, which is in development. A subscale version has been flight tested. The Soviet's manned space program has a broad range of military applications, Earth reconnaissance, for example. In 1986, the USSR launched a new generation space station, Mir, it replaces the aging Salyut 7. With Mir, the Soviets probably have begun a permanent manned presence in space. Their cosmonauts' work programs include both reconnaissance and targeting. From Mir, they can experiment with cameras, spectrometers, and multispectral sensors, evaluating their ability to locate, identify, and track targets from outer space. This research could be an important first step in designing space weapons for use against targets in space and on Earth. By the mid-90s, the Soviets should be able to construct an even larger space station, which would be launched on the heavy lift vehicle. A space station for up to 100 has been discussed. It has been decided not only to make more active use of the defense sectors of industry to produce civilian output and consumer goods, but also to involve them in the retooling of light industry. This suggests a shift in Soviet industry from guns to butter. Yet throughout the Soviet military, force modernization continues. Nowhere is this growth more apparent than in conventional forces. 
this will be increasingly critical to the balance of power in Europe. Since 1981, the number of new model T-64, T-72, and T-80 main battle tanks deployed with Soviet forces increased steadily. They now make up about 40% of the tank force. The T-64 and T-80 have laser rangefinders and can fire anti-tank missiles through their main guns. The Warsaw Pact units are also upgrading many of their older tanks with add-on armor, new powertrains, new guns, and fire control systems. This T-64 tank can be quickly fitted with reactive armor and added protection for tanks. Add-on protection also comes from wraparound armor and side skirts. These developments are providing greater firepower and mobility on the modern battlefield. Self-propelled guns, as well as mortars, are replacing older towed models. Self-propelled artillery now can move forward as rapidly as armor. Fire support is no longer the limiting factor in an advance. Multiple rocket launchers, like this large 280 millimeter version, can devastate large areas in a single salvo. To support their chemical warfare effort, Soviet ground forces alone have some 60,000 chemical troops and 30,000 special vehicles for reconnaissance and decontamination. Delivery systems include the Frog and Scud missiles, bombs, artillery, and multiple rocket launchers. Today, Soviet research facilities continue to develop new or more lethal chemical agents. A new generation of surface-to-air missiles, like this SA-16, presents a formidable threat to NATO helicopters, while the new longer-range SAX-12B will threaten aircraft and some types of missiles at all altitudes. Two of the newest fighter aircraft, the Mach 2 Fulcrum and Flanker, have a look-down, shoot-down radar and missile system. This equipment allows them to intercept low-flying aircraft, a difficult task. These aircraft will be particularly important as NATO increases its reliance on cruise missiles. The Soviet AWACS aircraft, the mainstay, will direct fighters like the Foxhound and Flanker to targets beyond the range of ground-based systems. Soviet naval capabilities continue to improve with impressive weapon systems. The 80s have seen two new classes of destroyer, the Sovremeni and the Udaloy, and two new classes of cruiser, the Kirov and Slava. The Kirov is the largest cruiser in the world. These surface combatants have a full complement of anti-ship cruise missiles, surface-to-air missiles, and their own anti-submarine warfare helicopters. The Soviet submarine fleet is growing too. The general purpose submarine force numbers about 300 vessels. The Soviets are producing a submarine about every 40 days. This Oscar class carries 24 anti-ship cruise missiles that would be targeted against NATO carrier battle groups. The Akula, believed to be the quietest Soviet submarine yet developed, challenges the West's anti-submarine warfare capability. The Soviets also are making progress on their evolutionary new aircraft carrier, another generation beyond the Kiev class. The new carrier, when first deployed, will carry V-stall aircraft but will eventually be outfitted with high-performance jet aircraft, making them formidable power projection platforms. They are afraid of a revival of the attractive force of socialist ideas. They are scared because good feelings for our country are again growing. A new discovery of the Soviet Union is taking place. This new discovery of the Soviet Union is far from universal. Leaders of the Third World do not necessarily characterize the Soviet Union as an attractive force. The 1979 invasion of Afghanistan was a clear demonstration of Soviet willingness to use force when they expected little resistance. Moscow's assessment proved to be badly flawed. The Soviet-backed invasion of Afghanistan and their backing of the coup in the People's Republic of Yemen has angered many Arab states. Libya, long supported and armed by the USSR, is now isolated and economically hard-pressed. Libya's war with Chad proved embarrassing. 
Chad's highly mobile forces were able to push back the Soviet-equipped Libyan forces and capture an impressive array of equipment. Efforts to gain a foothold in the Far East have not paid off as well as Moscow hoped, with the exception of Vietnam. At a cost of about $7 billion in military aid, they have little to show in return except Kamran Bay, which is the largest Soviet naval base outside the USSR. While some agreements have been signed, the courtship of China and the South Pacific nations is producing few of the economic or strategic objectives the Soviets would like. In Africa, political gains made during the 70s have started to reverse. Anti-communist insurgencies in Angola and Mozambique challenge Marxist governments. The Soviets have also worked hard to exploit political instability in Latin America. The USSR utilizes its established ties with communist governments in Cuba and Nicaragua to improve relations in the region. In Nicaragua, Soviet aid has grown to about $300 million per year to keep the Sandinistas in power. While these recent reversals in Soviet foreign policy seem to pretend a lessening of competition for influence in the Third World, quite the opposite is true. The Soviet Union is showing a new appreciation for diplomacy in its competition with the West. In Moscow, there's a new dexterity in soliciting world opinion as a tool to achieve Soviet goals. At home, Soviet leaders speak more of peace and disarmament than in the past. They talk of reasonable sufficiency for defense and a non-threatening force structure. Yet Dmitry Yazov, Minister of Defense, wrote recently that Soviet forces still must be capable of decisive offensive operations. The Soviets no longer speak openly of winning a nuclear war. Yet they continue to build the strategic offensive and defensive means to fight one. They no longer speak of seizing the initiative and taking the offensive. But their military doctrine and capabilities, validated by their defense minister, continues to emphasize offensive operations. Despite Soviet public relations efforts, Soviet actions demonstrate a continued growth in military capabilities. Western defense policy must be made in light of the cold reality of this growing military strength and not on the carefully chosen words coming from the Soviet Union. As this report has documented, Soviet military power and the threat that power represents are not abstract notions. Soviet military capabilities continue to grow. New generations of weapon systems will continue to flow from military research and development and from a military industrial base that receives the highest priority in the Soviet Union. It is my hope that this candid portrait of the USSR's military forces and the threat they represent to the free world will assist all Americans, our friends and allies, to appreciate the tremendous size and scope of the security challenges before us and to fashion enduring defense programs for our collective security.